Okay, so I'm going to very quickly cover how we're doing in health, some of the major reasons for our poor performance, looking at issues both outside and within the health sector, and then I want to focus a bit more on some of these key new policies, the NHI and the current approach to implementing it, which is called re-engineering primary health care, look at some of the challenges and opportunities and some priorities. So, how are we doing? Sorry, um, I've got to get used to... Um. So, this graph, you may not be able to see all the countries from the back, but this plots wealth against health. So, wealth is on the horizontal axis, going from very little up to... 50,000 US dollars. And on the y-axis, the vertical, it looks at life expectancy at birth. So you will see that some countries are above the line, like Bangladesh. It's doing better than you might expect for its level of wealth. China is also above the line, and the size of the circle is the size of the population. Where's South Africa? As you can see, we are way, way below the line. In fact, our life expectancy would be more in keeping with countries such as Cameroon or Niger. So, these are some of our health indicators. And as you can see, life expectancy is extremely low. Infant mortality, that is deaths before one year of age, are extremely high. And there are big provincial disparities, three times as high uh, in uh, the Eastern Cape as in the Western. Under five mortality, similarly, very high. And again, over twice as high in KZN versus the Western Cape, and a very high maternal mortality, that's deaths of women associated with pregnancy and childbirth. And I think you know we have the world's biggest HIV epidemic. So it's clear we have huge inequalities, and the inequalities really bring the average down. That's why we perform so poorly because our most populous provinces have such very, very poor health indicators. So this is a slightly old slide. Don't pay attention to the actual levels. But on the extreme left is Western Cape and on the extreme right is the Eastern Cape in terms of young child mortality. And even in Cape Town, this is some work from some years ago done by myself and colleagues looking at what were then the 11 sub-districts of Cape Town. And you can see infant mortality, the percent of households below the poverty line, HIV prevalence and percentage unemployment is concentrated in a few of those districts. You see we have our own twin towers in, uh, in Cape Town still existing. Of course, this is not confined to South Africa. Even in a country like Canada, there are big differences in life expectancy between the lowest income group, a tercile, that's 33% of the population, and the highest income. But of course, the disparities are not nearly as great as they are in South Africa. So what's causing this? Well, we've got four what are called colliding epidemics. Everyone's familiar with the HIV and TB one, with the problems of young children and mothers, and this relates especially to malnutrition and infectious diseases, diarrhea, pneumonia, newborn deaths, and so on. We have a huge epidemic of injury and violence, and a gathering and accelerating epidemic of chronic diseases diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancers, and so on. 
This is truly going to overwhelm our health service in the next decade or two. So what's causing this problem? What are the determinants? You may not be able to read this well from the back, but it says factors influencing infant mortality in South Africa comparing the poorest one-fifth of the population with the richest one-fifth. So in the circle, there is wealth. So you can see in the wealthiest, 20%, infant mortality is 22, and in the richest, uh, the poorest, it's 87, exactly four times as high. And similarly, for education, which is the brown one, rural urban, the next, and by province, again, Eastern and Western Cape, and finally, by race, black and white. So just note, the white infant mortality is 15 per thousand. And many white people in this country live very well. In fact, most do. But you know, average infant mortality in a country like Norway is less than five. So even for the best off in our country, infant mortality is three times as high as it should be when compared to groups in the global north that are in the same income range. I'll come back to this. What I'm saying is inequality is bad for everyone. Of course it's worst for the poorest, but it's bad for everyone. And we know that in terms of violence, for example, in our society. It doesn't only affect the poorest, it affects them worst, but it affects everyone. So a fundamental social determinant is poverty. <coughs> <clears throat> this just uh, shows some data on child poverty where it's shocking that six out of every ten children live in households with an income of less than 575 rand per person per month. And it really makes me mad when, when I'm teaching people talk about the poor misusing their money. And I always say to them, excuse me, could you live on 575 rand a month? And think about it. It's extremely difficult. You have to be very clever, actually, to live on 575 rand a month. So this is the income share by decile. The population divided up into 10%. And you can see that 90% of people have a very, very small percentage share of the income. And 10% share 55% of total income in this country, and it's getting worse. There's 1993 compared with 2008. So what about the health sector itself? I've talked about some of the social determinants outside the health sector. What are the key challenges to improving access and quality? So there was a series published in the prestigious Lancet Journal a few years ago. And they came up with three issues that the health sector, three actions that need to be taken. One is regarding the health workforce. More, more skilled, and more dedicated workforce. Sustainable and equitable access. That means access for everyone in terms of their need. And competence and accountability of managers and leaders. So let's look at health expenditure. Louis kindly provided me with these slides. So if you look at South Africa's health spending in the panel on your left, you can see that, and this goes by years, you can see that it's gone up pretty sharply, and it is way above the Africa region average. In fact, we spend more per capita than any other country in the region, in the Africa region. 
And I show on the right panel, because I'll come back to it, a very poor country, Rwanda, where you can see they spend far less than the regional average and far, far less than South Africa. So Robbie showed this, and just here uh, graphically, in South Africa, on the right, 35 million people rely wholly on the public sector, and they have approximately 1,900 rand spent on them per year, per person. And on the left, the 8 million about 15% of the population, 16% that rely wholly on the private sector, and they have about 11,300 rand spent on them. And in the middle, there are people, 8 million, who use both. They mainly use the public sector, but when they need to get to work and they can't afford to wait in line, they go and use a private GP, something like that. So, the size of our private insurance in South Africa as a percentage of total health care expenditure is actually the highest in the world. It's higher even than the US. You see it goes South Africa, Namibia, and then the US. And as you know, Namibia was part of South Africa before, so it's not surprising. So is this a problem? So there is actually some empirical work done, not a lot, but Maureen McIntosh is the best researcher on this, and she shows healthy life expectancy on the vertical axis plotted against government expenditure on health as a percentage of GDP. And you can see there is an increase with government expenditure. And she shows the opposite in systems where private health expenditure is a large percentage of, of expenditure. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, I'm going to show it and come back. So here's the US compared to Costa Rica. So the US is an extremely privatized health system. At the bottom, you'll see what their health expenditure is, 5,700 US per person per year. Costa Rica, only $350. Gross national income, US per capita, is 10 times that of Costa Rica. And yet, life expectancy and infant mortality are about the same. Costa Rica's got a public system and is highly equitable. So, what are we spending on? Well, we're spending especially on health workforce. So, South Africa, compared to the region, again, has four times almost as many health workers as the rest of the region. And Rwanda, by contrast, has about half the density of doctors. These are doctors compared to the Africa region. This just shows South Africa compared to other countries. But as Robbie showed, in the public sector, there's one person to 4,200 doctors. And if you're up in Limpopo, it's more like one to every 15,000 people. Whereas those who use the private sector, one doctor for only 600 people. So 70% of specialists are in the private sector, serving 16% of the population. And about 50% of doctors are in the private sector, serving 15%. So how well are we doing? So this shows immunization coverage in South Africa. And South Africa is the triangles and the regional average is almost the same as in South Africa, except we've now dipped below the regional average. Rwanda, on the other hand, is way above the regional average, despite being an extremely poor country. 
So here are some other statistics on coverage where we're not doing very well with our vitamin A supplementation program, with antenatal care, with exclusive breastfeeding, and so on. And this shows, again, South Africa compared with Rwanda, where you can see we now, both countries, have similar under five mortality. Our Millennium Development Goal is the bottom dotted line, so we won't reach it. And Rwanda's already reached its MDG goal of reducing under five mortality. So, finally, two major new health policies. NHI, which Robbie has talked about, and the current strategy to implement the NHI, which is called re-engineering primary health care. So, the NHI is a mechanism for ensuring that everyone's able to get care when they need it and that they're financially protected from out-of-pocket costs. And the principles have already got, been gone over, so I'll leave those. So it's intended to increase funding, total pool of funding, through increased allocations from tax, a mandatory contribution, uh, kind of earmarked, small percentage, a levy if you like, Removal of tax subsidies to medical aids, which Robbie talked about, which has got the private sector quite excited, because it will escalate our medical aid costs. And these funds will go into a pool, which will be called the NHI fund, <coughs> as far as we know. And then this fund will purchase from accredited public and private providers. The medical schemes, so far as we know, will remain, but it's likely, because they'll be more expensive, membership will decline. So there will be an Office of Standards Compliance, which has already been set up, which is accrediting facilities. And currently, NHI is being piloted in 11 districts through re-engineering of primary health care. So there are three streams in this re-engineering. One is a ward-based outreach team for each ward, that means each sub-district, a school health stream, and district-based clinical specialist teams. I'm just going to talk about one of these and then end. So this is a diagram for our re-engineering NHI. You won't make head or tail of it, um, but it shows all of the components. The interesting one for me is the one on the right, shaped as a coffin, uh, and that's local government. I don't know if this is just a mistake, <laughs> but local government is shaped like a coffin. <clears throat> so the community outreach teams um, consist of a nurse, six community health workers, and other members, an environmental health officer, and um, a health promoter. These community health workers will cover households. Each one will cover 270 households. So how are we doing? There's recently been, and it was presented just a few weeks ago to the Portfolio Committee, a 12-month progress report. And I've just got some of the slides. So there's a green paper, and I believe we have some copies of People's Health Movement response to the green paper in the room. Uh, and the white paper is under preparation. So these 11 pilot districts. These 11 domains have been appraised. And I'm not going to show you all of them. It's about management, hospitals, quality, human resources, and so on. So green means nearly or completely achieved, yellow partially, red <coughs> minimally. So for management, a full-time NHI project manager in these 11 districts, you can see four out of 11 so far. Facility improvement team in place doing quite well, 
but the overall score for quality is very low if you look at the second bar and in fact has deteriorated since last year, which is in this slide, I won't show it. The presence of district clinical specialist teams where there's supposed to be seven in post. And only two have members in, in uh, a full complement. I'm almost finished anyway. And for human resources, there is a lot of yellow, some green, no red. That's good. And I'll leave that one. So, finally, what are the key challenges? Well, I think there are challenges in, in partnering with the private sector, in improving, improving governance and accountability, and especially in having enough human resources both in terms of numbers and competences. And I think Louis will talk about the competences. So the NHI could be a mechanism to redistribute healthcare resources. And People's Health Movement strongly supports a people-centered NHI. But we need to overcome some key challenges. We need to know what's going to be the package of services. We don't know yet. This is under wraps being debated. Secondly, <coughs> is there going to be sufficient capacity and accountability to administer this very big pool of funds? Thirdly, regulation of the private sector and, of course, administration of this whole fund. It's not an easy thing to manage a purchaser-provider arrangement. We need to, in my view and PHM's view, rapidly increase the ratio of community health workers to households. 1 to 270 is insufficient. And in the National Development Plan, there's a proposal, which we smuggled in, to have many, many more, which could create lots more jobs. And finally, we really need to do much, much better with training. We haven't got enough people, they're not in the right places, they're not properly orientated, and if government doesn't invest enough in creating more posts, training more people in appropriate ways, and finding ways to get our quite large complement of health practitioners out there, I think we're going to have a problem in implementing this. But if we continue in the same way as we are now, I'm afraid only a few people will be able to enjoy private health care, which actually is extremely inefficient. It's very expensive. There's huge over-servicing, and it's increasingly unaffordable. Thank you. <laughs>